I, I've been working for many years on a translation of Fu Songling's wonderful collection, the Liao Zhai Zhiyi, which I call Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio. And um, last week, I talked about Fu Songling himself in very general terms, talking about his life, his biography, his marriage, his family, and so on, and his, his situation in, in the world of um, the 17th and 18th century China. And, um, and I then shared with you a couple of stories. One was called Blue Phoenix, which is basically a love story, and the other was, was a kind of sequel to that called A Foxy Dream. Um, and um, today I'm going to just go one step further. I want to basically put aside biographical and uh, historical considerations and go straight to the stories themselves. So what I've done is I've chosen 20 stories today. 20. Sounds like a lot. You won't be here till midnight, I promise you, because 17 of them are very, very short. So I'm going to start off by by telling you, by retelling the stories and talking a little bit about um, 20 stories. And I'm going to begin with 17 very short ones. But um, before that, I want to just... Um, I want to just um, pause for a moment and think about these um, extraordinary um, tales and the way in which people have been, have been looking at them. And I've chosen some, some images, some pictures, basically. This is actually the picture taken from my book, which was published in 2006, the first collection of stories from the Jai. I chose 106 to go into this book for Penguin Classics. The complete tales are about 500. It depends how you count them, because some of the stories have three parts and so on, but roughly, let's say, 500. So I've already translated and published 106. And I'm, I'm just finishing polishing the second volume, which will be another 150. But by the time I've done that, um, I will have done half the book. And really, it's very hard to choose, because all the stories are, are quite extraordinarily good. And, uh, and Po Sung Ling himself would have done a lot of choosing and throughout his life, because he went on writing these stories to within a few years of his death. And um, each one, each one is a little gem of its own. Each one is, 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 is perfectly crafted. It has, a, it has a beginning, a middle and an end. And even the very short ones are very cleverly crafted. Um, now, what I've given you in the handout are actually, um, is, is really work in progress. These are my current draft translations of 20 stories. And I'm asking you, please, do not share these with other people. These are not yet published. I was thinking of maybe asking you to hand in all the handouts, but frankly, I would rather trust you to respect my um, rights as a translator. Take these home by all means, but don't please um, either copy them or share them with anybody, because they are unpublished um, draft translations. Um, right, well, I mean, Let's get down to the real, the, the real meat of the thing, which is the stories themselves. And um, I've chosen, first of all, what I call 17 shorter tales. And some of them are very, very short. But let's just take the first one. And it's, it's, it's called a strange louse. You know, a louse is an insect that tends to grow in your hair and bite you and can be extremely unpleasant. And this is how the story goes. There was a certain villager who was sitting beneath a tree when he felt a louse on his body. Before going on his way, he took hold of it, wrapped it in a piece of paper, and stuffed it into a hole in the tree. Two or three years later, he happened to be passing by the same tree, and remembering the louse, he looked for the piece of paper in the hole. There it was. He took it out and examined the louse, which was by now dry and shriveled like a husk of wheat. He placed it on the palm of his hand and studied it closely, whereupon he began to feel a strange itching on his palm. He watched as the belly of the desiccated louse, the dried louse, slowly started to swell. 
he threw the thing aside and returned home. On the spot in his palm where he had felt the itching, a hard lump now appeared. It continued to cause him pain and to swell over the next few days until finally the man died. Now, how can we describe that story? I mean, it is, it is a uniquely Chinese form. It's what they, what they called in the past a, a piece of fiction that records something bizarre, something strange, something weird. And really that's all the, the stories in Liao Zhe, they all have that in common. They all recount the story of something strange, something weird, something unusual, something bizarre. And that in this case, it's, it's a very bizarre phenomenon. It's, it's, it's the way an insect um, kind of dies, dries up, becomes completely um, in a, inanimate. And yet when he puts it in his hand, it comes back to life and eventually he dies from a kind of growth. And I, when I was translating this story, I took some time off to, to look up other stories about lice and insects, especially, and there are quite a lot of them in, in the great um, work of Li Shizhen, the Ben, ben Cao Gang Mu, the great pharmacopoeia of Chinese medicine. And I found a story quite similar to this, actually. And um, this really um, brings me to a fundamental point about these stories. They belong in a category which is really unique to Chinese literature and which we can call um, Bi Ji Xiao Shuo, the fiction of jottings, the, fi the informal fiction. We don't really have anything like it, I mean, in, in English or in French that I'm aware of. Um, to go back to my pictures, um, people have read these stories in all kinds of different ways. I'm trying to communicate with you today my way of reading these stories because I believe it to be helpful to get beyond some of the cliches, some of the stereotypes. And these pictures I put together, this, this is actually a very, a very popular picture of Pu Sung Ling at his, at his candle in the cold winter night writing his stories. That's of no great importance. Um, this is a, one, of the, one of the common images of a Hu Li Jing, of a girl who actually is half girl, half fox. And it, it appeals to a certain, um, I would say, romantic side in the Chinese imagination. It's almost an obsession. Um, and then this is another picture of, of the kind of loneliness that pervades many of these stories. There are many, many, there are many, many aspects of Pu Sung Ling, and, um, and there are many, many um, illustrations that kind of um, capture the way people read the story. This is the famous story, Hua Pi, The Painted Skin, and it was made into a movie many times, and every time it was made into a bad movie, I have to say, because they don't really understand the story. And what I'm trying to do in my translations and in my talk today is to guide you, if I can, towards a way of reading them which puts them in a certain place as the literature of, of the bizarre. And we, we all, I think, live in our lives, we become aware of strange things happening, you know. And um, you can either become very superstitious about them or you can regard them as part of nature. When I was a young, young man, probably the same age as most of you students here today, I bought a book called Supernature, which was basically saying there is no such thing as the supernatural. Everything is part of nature. So even the most strange thing is actually part of nature. It's part of what happens in the natural world. And in this case, with the Laos, you know, we're talking about a rather unusual um, physical phenomenon that is connected with, with, with the natural world. And um, before going too much further, I think I, think I should put that Zhigui Xiao Shua idea in a kind of context, because um, it belongs in, in the wider um, genre of Bi Ji, Bi Ji, the Bi Ji, literally pen records. And every Chinese Wenren, every, every literary person in Chinese history wrote BG, huge amounts of it. I mean, every, every scholar today, even my, my teacher, the wonderful Professor Liu Cunren, he kept a diary which was basically a BG. It was basically his noting everything that had happened in that day, but in a form in classical Chinese, 
and written with a calligraphic brush. And this, this concept of Biji Wenxue is, is very hard to communicate to a non-Chinese uh, readership because it, on the one hand it's very informal, but on the other hand it's very, very, uh, very polished because it's the product of a very, very highly educated, very highly cultivated elite. And Po Sung Ming was one of that elite. And um, in, in, within, the, within the general category of DG Wen Shui, which includes letters, journals, travelogues, all kinds of different forms of informal literature, within that you have a specific category called DG Xiao Shuo, or fiction of the DG kind. And that's what Pu Sung Ming is writing. He's writing fiction which is of many different shapes and sizes, but it's all written in classical Chinese and in the informal way of the BG. Um, and then side by side with that, and, and still part of BG Wenzhui, you have the, the Chuanqi, the, the, um, the Tang and Song dynasties, the golden and silver ages of Chinese culture, produce wonderful stories that were sort of medium length novellas, really. We call them novellas. In modern Chinese, they would be a Zhong Tian Xiao Shuo. And they often had quite involved plots. Very often they were about um, romance between a, a boy and a girl. Sometimes they were about um, Wu Xia, about martial arts. Sometimes they were about historical characters. They were quite well developed, Biji, Biji Xiao Shuo. And that was another tradition which Pu Songling inherited. And um, side by side with the Chi, within the BG overall genre, you've got the Zhikwai Xiao Shuo, which literally means the fiction that records something bizarre. And The Strange Loves, the first story I've shared with you, this is an absolute typical Zhikwai Xiao Shuo. It doesn't talk about love, it doesn't talk about um, human relationships, it just talks about a strange insect and something weird that happens to the poor man who, who, who sees, he takes the last, maybe it's in his hair, takes it out, and rather than crushing it to death, he, he puts it in a piece of paper and he puts it in a hole in the tree. And one of the, one of the commentators says, what a kind man he was to save the life of that louse. And then he comes back many years later, finds the dried up louse and ends up dying because he holds it in the palm of his hand. So it's a, it's a tiny, tiny story. I mean, that's how long it is. It's ten lines in English. And um, it's very memorable. It's very memorable. Um, now, the second story is called Nocturnal Lights, or Ye Ming, literally Night Bright. Now, this story is, again, very short. There was a certain merchant Often the stories begin, there was a certain young man, a certain merchant, a certain whatever. This, this time it's a merchant. He was traveling in the southern seas when sometime around midnight he saw from his boat a great light illuminating the night sky till it seemed as bright as dawn. Going out on deck to look, he beheld a huge creature in the sea the upper half of its body rearing up like a mountain out of the water. Its eyes blazed in the sky like twin suns, emitting dazzling rays of light in every direction <clears throat> across the entire surface of the ocean. It almost reads like Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. This is a very, very dramatic Zhiguai Xiao Shuo. Greatly amazed by this sight, the merchant questioned the sailors on board ship, but none of them knew anything about it. They all crouched in terror on the deck, gazing at the apparition. After a while, it sank slowly down into the sea, and all around them was dark once more. It's very cinematic. Some of, some of Pu Sung Ling's writing is incredibly visual, ideal for, for, for what I would call art film, you know. I don't mean the rubbish that gets made, you know, in the, in, 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 in the film studios, like the ten film, films of Huapi. I mean something almost abstract, something very, very, very condensed. And this would be an excellent example. When the boat reached the coast of Fujian province, 
the local inhabitants spoke of a night during which the sky had suddenly become bright and had then just as suddenly grown dark again. They simply regarded it as a strange natural phenomenon. When the merchant counted the days, he calculated that this had indeed occurred on exactly the same night on which he had seen the huge creature. So it's, a, it's just a weird event. In this case, it's not a louse um, biting into the palm of the hand. It's, it's something out there. It's, it's, it could happen in the sky, at sea. It could be an earthquake. There are several little stories in the Algae about earthquakes or about floods. It's a natural, it's almost like a weather event, you know, a typhoon or a cyclone, except this is a kind of a bright light in the middle of the night. And it's written very briefly, very um, poignantly, uh, as, 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 as an account. And um, we can ignore that. Um, this is one of the original illustrations of the Laos story from a late 19th century edition. And um, here's, an, here's an illustration of the lights, the, the, the strange creature. Um, can I get this to work? Let's have a look. Hmm. Anyway, um, that, that, that is the strange creature that suddenly emerged in the middle of the night. And, and this edition from the late 19th century is quite helpful because it, although it's about 200 years after Pu Song Ling, it shows the, the, the Chinese imagination at work. And in my book, in my selections, I use these illustrations because I think they're very helpful. Um, this next little one, this next little zhi guai xiao shuo, it, it, there is no, I, I couldn't find an illustration for it. It's just called a change of gender. Rather a topical subject nowadays when everybody's wanting to be he, she, or they, you know. But in this case it just says hua nan, being turned into a man. And just goes that, it's very simple. In the small town of Mu Du near Suzhou, a woman of unpretentious origins was sitting one night in the courtyard of her house. When suddenly a star came shooting down from heaven, landing right on top of her head. She fell lifeless to the ground. Her mother and father, who were elderly and had no other child, cried out aloud in lamentation, calling desperately for help. In an instant, the woman was revived. She came back to life, and she said to them with a smile on her face, I'm a man now. They examined her closely and found this to be true. None of the family saw this as the doing of some malevolent force. They didn't see it as a bad thing. On the contrary, they were secretly pleased to have a man in the family. This strange event took place in the year 1707. That's typical of Pu Su Ling. He tells this little tiny story, but to make people realize that he's not just inventing it, he gives a date. Of course, the date may be completely fictitious. But if it isn't, then we know he wrote this in the very last years of his life, because he died in 1715. Well, of all the short stories, the, the very short ones, there are two that I particularly love, because I'm a, I'm a very big dog lover myself. I was born in the year of the dog, 1946. So I'm a bit of a dog, and I've had dogs all my life. And my, one of my names for my studio is the San Quan Tang, the Hall of the Three Dogs, because I had three dogs. So Pu Sung Ling, I think, must have liked dogs because he wrote several stories about dogs. And I've chosen two today. The first one, they're actually both called Yi Quan, which, which, but I've given them different titles. The first one I've called The Devoted Dog. Let's see if I can get this to move. Or oh, maybe I've gotten the wrong way around here. Okay, uh, we'll go to The Devoted Dog. Um, a certain merchant of Joe Village had been doing, again, a certain merchant, a typical beginning of one of his stories, had been doing business in the county of Lake Wu in the neighboring province of Anhui. And he was returning home by boat with the substantial profits he had made when he saw a butcher tying up a dog on the riverbank. 
he bought the animal for much more than its market value because he was quite sure the butcher was going to cut the dog up and sell the meat. And he kept it with him on his boat. So the man was kind to the dog. Now, the boatman of the boat on which he was travelling had formerly been a bandit. And he was tempted, and tempted by his passengers' evident wealth. He deliberately ran the boat among the rushes and, drawing a knife, prepared to kill him. The merchant begged him not to cut off his head, but to leave his body whole. So the boatman simply wrapped him in a carpet and threw him overboard. So this, this one's got a bit of a plot, you know. It's not just like a, you know, a simple thing. It's actually a storyline. So I mean, we, we can watch now Puss in Moon developing a storyline. And um, this, uh, the boatman has wrapped him up in a blanket and thrown him into the water. His dog, on seeing this, began to whine piteously and jumped into the river. He seized the bundle in his teeth and floated with it downstream, bobbing up and down, until at length, after several miles, he reached a shallow stretch of water. The dog emerged from the water. Coming to a place where there were some people, it attracted their attention by continuous and frantic barking. You know, he's, he saved his master, and now he wants the people to come and do something, so he barks, you know. Some of them found the dog's behavior strange, and following it, they came across the bundle still floating in the water. They dragged it out and untied it. The merchant was still alive, and he told them his story, asking him to be taken back to Lake Wu, where he might seek out the bandit boatman. But when he eventually set off in that direction, he was most distressed to see that his dog was no longer there. He spent several days at Lake Wu without being able to find, among the forests of masts, the particular boat and the boatman he was after. Now, a fellow countryman was about to take him home when suddenly the dog appeared and began barking loudly at its master, seeming to invite him to follow in a certain direction. The merchant left his boat and followed the dog, who leapt onto a nearby boat and seized one of the boatmen by the leg. The man struck out at him, but the dog wouldn't let go. The merchant went closer and saw that this man was indeed the very bandit boatman he'd been searching for. He had changed his clothes, his attire, and taken on a new boat, a new boat, and at first sight had been unrecognizable. He was duly arrested and searched, and all the merchant's money was recovered. How extraordinary for a dog to show such devotion and gratitude. Truly, there are not a few callous human beings who would be put to shame by this animal. So it's, a, it's, it's quite poetic. It's a little, little story in praise of the loyalty of dogs. And any of you who, who have had dogs will know that dogs are amazingly loyal and devoted to their master. Now, a similar story is the faithful dog. Uh, about, about another very devoted animal. But I think I'll probably move on, because I, I, otherwise I'm going to run out of time. So when you, you can read that one at home. Um, now, um, sorry, I need to have a drink. <clears throat> That's actually the one we just read, I just read, that one there. And this is the picture for the other, the other dog story. Mm. Now, um, sometimes Paul Sungli would divide his, his stories into three bits, you know. That's why it's quite hard to actually count the number of stories in Liao Jai Zhi Yi. And this is, this is, a, this is an example. Um, I've, I've numbered it number six to eight. And I've called it Three Fits of Laughter. And it's a story of how, different, in different circumstances, people laugh. And um, you can kind of interpret that in different ways. Let's jump to the um, second and third ones. Um, the second one is a kind of story about the absurdity of a situation in which someone's laughing. And it says that Mr. Sun Jing Xia 
the preceptor, the teacher of the Confucian school, paid a visit one day to a friend. This is on page five. Paid a visit one day to a friend. On arriving at the door of his friend's house, he heard a peal of laughter coming from within. Ha, 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 ha. Someone was laughing away. But he couldn't hear anyone talking. There was no sound of people talking. At first he thought it must be a friend sharing a joke with other people. But when he knocked and entered, he was astonished to find the man was quite alone inside. <laughs> I'm free at the moment. Just come in, do come in. I was just practicing one of my jokes. I mean, it's like a tiny little t television sketch. His friend was simply in his room practicing a joke and laughing at his own joke. It's a kind of story of the absurd, if you like. Um, and um, there's something almost Zen about it. It's 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 very uh, it is it is a story of the absurd. Um, if we move on very quickly to um, number nine, the human tripod. Now this is a bit shocking. I must warn you, it's rather a shocking story, quite graphic in it, in its detail, and um, it's one of the stories that proves to anybody that Porcelain Ling was not writing for children. This is a very adult story. And I think I'll read it because it's really quite extraordinary. A certain gentleman, on page six now, a certain gentleman of Jining Tan in the province of Shandong, in the province of Shandong, once happened upon an itinerant monk, a traveling monk, who was sitting in the sun in the fields outside a temple, picking out the lice on his body. You know, he was obviously a poor beggar monk. And he had a bottle gourd hanging from his staff. The, the bottle gourd is often a symbol of um, either an alchemist who has, or, or of a traveling monk who has medicine to sell. He looked very much like a traveling seller of herbal remedies. Your reverence, quipped the gentleman, do you by any chance sell medicines to enhance the act of love? I do, replied the monk. My pills can both stiffen the soft and enlarge the small. The results are immediate. There's no need to wait until the following day. So these are like sex aids, you see. The man was delighted and asked to buy one of these remedies, whereupon the monk untied a corner of his cassock and produce a pill the size of a grain of millet, quite small, which he told the man to swallow. After about the time it would take for a pot of rice to cook, the man's member began to swell considerably. A moment later he felt it and could tell that it was a good third longer than it had been. Not content with this result, however, he waited for the monk to go off and relieve himself and then secretly untied the cassock and swallowed a few more of the pills. Suddenly he felt as if his skin was bursting apart. His sinews began to twitch, his neck shrank, and he became all hunched up. All the while, his member kept growing and growing in size. It simply wouldn't stop. By now he was positively terrified, quite at his wit's end as to what to do. Presently the monk returned, and quickly sizing up the situation, said in some alarm, you've obviously taken stolen some of my pills. The monk gave the man another pill at once, an antidote. And finally, the unrelenting growth abated. The man took off his clothes to examine himself and could see that now, instead of the two legs he had once been endowed with, he had become a veritable three-legged cauldron, a human tripod. He shambled home, so twisted and hunched up that even his own parents failed to recognize him. He remained a deformed cripple for the rest of his life and lay in the street every day, a spectacle for passers-by. Now, this story, which is quite shocking, I mean, it's a story about a man who is so desperate um, to, to get hold of an aphrodisiac that he ends up um, becoming a cripple, um, it reminds me very much of the writing of, of the modern writer Lu Xun, who who uses the, sometimes uses the very brief form 
to, to make a comment about human behavior. And this, this is exactly what this is. Um, the next story, the deaf preceptor. Now, um, a preceptor is simply a teacher, by the way. It's rather an old-fashioned word. Sometimes when translating these stories, I use slightly old-fashioned words. For example, instead of saying he saw something, I might say he beheld. Beheld is the word for to see used often in the Bible, for example, because I try to achieve a slightly um, old-fashioned um, style when translating Pu Sun Ling. Now this is, a, this is a slightly more subtle story than the previous one. The previous one was just about a man who wanted to, um, you know, he, he wanted a sex pill that would help him and ended up taking too much, you know, and, that, and then paid the price. This is a slightly more humorous one, but also has a slightly sexual connotation. A certain preceptor was extremely hard of hearing, a bit like me, he was almost deaf. Luckily, he was on very intimate terms with a fox spirit who would repeat everything to him in a whisper, thereby enabling him, page seven, to understand what was being said. So he, he had a little Hu Li Jing sitting on his shoulder um, like a hearing aid, you know, so he could hear what was being said. Wonderful, I wish I could have one of those. Uh, my hearing aid, in fact, I've forgotten to bring it today, but my hearing aid is very annoying and modern and Danish. I'd much rather have a little Huli Jing on my shoulder. Whenever the preceptor, whenever he had to call on his superiors, the Huli Jing would, would accompany, would come with him and whisper in his ear, and as a result, nobody was aware that he was deaf. He, got, he managed to function, he was functioning pretty well thanks to his personal interpreter. Five, five or six years went by in this fashion, and then one day the fox took her leave of him. She said, I'm afraid I've got to go now. They always do that. With me gone, I'm afraid you'll be no more than a puppet without a puppeteer, she said to him. You won't be able to function properly. You better resign from your post now before your deafness causes your disgrace. So he's losing his hearing aid, and uh, she tells him, you better resign because you'll be in trouble. But the man was too fond of his salary to heed her advice, with the result that from that day forth, he was constantly making a complete fool of himself. His superior, the commissioner, wanted to dismiss him, but the preceptor prevailed upon a senior colleague to put in a good word for him. One day he was taking part in the invigilation of an exam. After the calling of the roll, the commissioner withdrew and sat chatting with the other preceptors. Each of them pulled out from within his boot a slip of paper listing the names of their preferred candidates, and doubtless the bribe offered for their advancement, and presented it to the commissioner, who finally turned to the deaf preceptor and asked with a smile, how is it that you have nothing for me, sir? Now, I need to explain perhaps what's going on here. You see, the examiners um, wanted their students to do well. So what they were doing, they were, they were giving the chief examiner, the, the commissioner, a piece of paper with the name of their preferred student, you know. Supposing I've got a student called Jimmy, and I want Jimmy to do well, I would go, and, I would go to the chief examiner, give him a piece of paper saying Jimmy, and slip him a $500 note, you know. That was, it's also a comment on a very corrupt practice. And then he, he turns to the deaf preceptor and says, why aren't you giving me a piece of paper kind of thing? Now the deaf man stared at him in blank incomprehension. He's deaf, he can't understand what's going on. And the man next to him nudged him with his elbow, at the same time slipping his hand down inside his boot to indicate what he should do. Now, the preceptor happened to keep tucked into his boot a number of dildos that he'd been asked to sell on behalf of a cousin. They're, they're a kind of sex aid. He interpreted the commissioner's smile as meaning that he would appreciate one of these sex aids for his own personal use. So, he said, I'm afraid these are the best ones I have, sir, he said, bowing deeply, and they're only worth eight cash each. I thought they were unworthy of being presented for your inspection. 
This set the entire company laughing, and the commissioner shouted at him to be gone at once, and subsequently had him cashiered, had him fired. So it's a misunderstanding. He thought that um, he thought the message meant give him one of your special sex aids which you're keeping in your boot, and he ended up making a fool of himself. But it's also a kind of social comment. So that's a kind of slightly different one from the previous one. And um, the next one is one I particularly like. I called it Karmic Affinity. This is number 11. I think I might even have a picture for this one, yes. This is a modern picture. Um, so it's halfway down page seven. It's about a carpenter. Um, Mr. Zhou Yodo, the military governor of Shandong, converted the former palace of the Ming prince, De Zhuang, into his official yamen. While the construction work was proceeding, a carpenter by the name of Feng Minghuan stayed in the palace on the night shift. He had just settled down in bed when he noticed one of the windows of his room swing slightly ajar. He could see the moon shining as bright as day. Outside, he saw a red hen standing on a low wall. As he looked at it, the bird flew up into the air and then landed on the ground. The next moment he beheld a young lady, naked down to her waist, come up to the window and peer in. Feng thought she must have an assignation, a rendezvous, with one of his fellow workmen. He lay there silently listening. But the others were all fast asleep. His heart now began beating faster and faster. Secretly, he hoped that she might have mistaken him for her lover. Before he knew it, she climbed in through the window and straight into bed with him. He was, needless to say, ecstatic, but said not a word. They made love. And then she went away. And she came to him in this fashion every night. So we've got the absolute typical Liao Jai now, the Liao Jai story about a man um, encountering a very beautiful woman. She's obviously, uh, she starts off by appearing as a red hen going like quack, cluck, 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 and then she turns into a beautiful woman and she just comes into his room and they get into bed. At first he had, he kept his misgivings to himself, but eventually he confessed to her that he thought she must have mistaken him for somebody else. Oh, not at all, she insisted. You're the man I wanted to be with. With time, the two of them grew fonder and fonder of each other. Then the work on the palace was finished and Feng had to leave. She waited for him in the wilds, the wilds outside the city. His village was not far away and she accompanied him home. When they reached his house, um, page eight, um, Feng discovered that she was invisible to his friends. From this, he knew that she was no mortal. You know, she was, she was not an ordinary mortal person. Several months went by and Feng's state of mind gradually deteriorated. This again, this is a typical um, Liao Jai sort of, I think they call it nowadays a trope. It's a, it's a typical way in which the stories develop. The young man is seduced, falls in love, and gradually he loses his health because he, is, he succumbs to the charms of this beautiful woman. He grew more and more nervous and fearful, and finally called in an exorcist to free him from his possession. But this had not the slightest effect. One night she came to him, dressed in her prettiest clothes, and she said, the karmic affinities of this world are predetermined. Those who are destined to come together cannot be sent away. Those who are destined to go cannot be detained. Today I have come to bid you farewell. And so saying, she left. That, this is a miniature form of what later we'll find is a much more extended story. It's got all the ingredients of a fully fledged um, romantic story about a, a human attachment between, in this case, um, a carpenter and, and a very beautiful young lady. And um, the key, of course, lies in this word karmic affinities, um, because underlying very, very many of the stories in, in the Liao Jai is this idea that 
um, human passion, that human love is actually predestined and is the result of karma. You know, the yin yang is the Chinese word from a previous life, and that these 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 karmic affinities are predetermined, and that everything in fact is karma. Um, I think we'll jump, we'll, we'll leave out the three dragons. They're, they're lovely little pieces, but they, you can read them for yourself. They're kind of weird. I think sometimes the word weird is the only word to describe these things. Um, and this is about the, the weird apparition of dragons in certain situations. That's very common in the Aljai. You know, you know in, in some of the earliest um, stories about Confucius, Kung Fu Tzu. Um, he's asked, did you ever go to meet Lao Tzu? Lao Tzu is supposed to have been the man who wrote the Tao Te Ching. And Confucius said, yes, I did. And then his disciples said to him, well, what did you think? What did you think of Lao Tzu? What was he like? And um, Confucius simply says, he was a dragon. So it's a way of, it's a kind of archetypal Chinese image of something truly extraordinary, you know. And um, unlike in the West, it's a big problem for translators because in the West, the dragon is a creature to be killed and St. George, you know, kills the dragon. Um, but in, in, in China, the dragon is an extraordinarily um, powerful but benevolent uh, figure. And, uh, and um, you know, when Confucius says Lao Tzu was a dragon, he means he was a superhumanly wonderful person, being. Um, I very much like the, this next one, number 15. A Song from the Heart, I've called it. Um, the bottom of page 8. It's a very short one, but I think it's a very poignant one, very, a very memorable one. There was once a gentleman named Zhang, of the town of Anxiu in Shandong province. He fell ill and took to his bed. Pu is, is 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 admired for the way he, he, he allows the narrative to flow, and I think this is a perfect example. So there was once a gentleman, and he fell ill and took to his bed. So we've already got the scene. He lay there staring at the ceiling above his, of, of his bedstead, when suddenly he beheld a tiny fellow, barely six inches in height, emerge from the region of his heart. So this tiny, tiny, tiny person comes out of his heart, right? He's lying in bed, he's not well, he's having, he's got a fever, right? And he's looking up at the, the ceiling of his bed, because they're like a four-poster bed, a traditional Chinese bed is like a small room. And he's looking up, and he said, then he sees this creature come out of his heart. And the creature was wearing a scholar's cap and, and robe, and looked very much like a member of the theatrical profession, looked like an actor. And he started to sing. This little creature comes out of his, his heart and starts singing him an aria, you know, in the lyrical kunju style. He had a light voice with a pleasantly pure timbre. In the ensuing monologue of the drama, the tiny actor introduces himself, giving his full name and, the place of or and his place of origin, which were exactly the same as Mr. Zhang's. And the plot of the opera from which he was singing coincided exactly with the events of Zhang's own life. After the fourth act, the little man recited some lines of verse and then promptly vanished. Zhang remembered the details of the plot well enough to repeat them to his friends. This story also occurs in Wang Shichun's well-known collection of tales. I mean, this little tiny story is very, very symbolic. It carries a very deeper meaning. And one of, one of the commentators, a man called Dan Ming Lun, I've given you the commentary here, he says, uh, he, says, he says at the end of the story, human life is, after all, no more than a play. These are the words that could come straight out of Shakespeare's The Tempest. Look into your own heart, and you can learn 
what your role is in this play and how the plot of your life will unfold. The one thing you can be sure of is this, the play's fair name and reputation will depend on your leading an honourable life. And the favourable denouement of the plot will depend on your living a life filled with honesty and integrity. So he wants to moralise a bit, but he's basically saying, you know, life is a play, which is in fact another way of saying life is a dream. Now oh, then, I must just check the time, because I've got a lot to get through. Okay. All right, the next one I've, I've translated as Petit Chignon. A chignon is a little top knot in your, in your hair, you know, in a woman's hair and, and sometimes in a man's hair. And this is, this is a, a quite um, developed little plot. Once again, the story begins with there was a certain man who lived in a village in the district of Changshan in the province of Shandong. So many of Pu Xunning's stories are set in Shandong because that's where he spent the entire, his entire life apart from one visit outside the province. He was, he was an absolute Shandong Ren. He lived in Shandong and um, he knew Shandong dialect. Anyway, whenever this man was at leisure, he received visits from a stranger of short stature who stayed and chatted with him in his home. This went on for some time without his knowing anything about the man. He became very curious to know more. So he's setting the scene for this story. There's a man and he used to get visits from a, a, a little guy who, and he didn't know much about him, but they would sit and talk over a cup of tea. Then one day the stranger said to him, in a few days time I shall be moving and we shall be neighbours. Sure enough, four or five days later, the short stranger called again and announced, now we're neighbours. I'll be able to come here and sit, sit at your feet morning and night. But when he asked the whereabouts of the stranger's new home, the fellow was extremely evasive and only pointed vaguely in a northerly direction. This is typical, you know, when, when there's somebody strange, whether it's a ghost or a, or a fox spirit or, or, or some other strange person, they give very vague information. Oh, I live somewhere around the corner, you know. You, you might not have seen my house, you know. Of course, it turns out to be um, even stranger. Now, from now on, the stranger's visits became daily, and he started asking if he could borrow various household items and pieces of furniture. This is the turning point in the plot. Could I borrow your um, electric kettle, please? Or your saucepan, you know, or your hair dryer? I need it, I need it, need it. And, and um, if, 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 if the guy ever said no, um, the, the, the thing in question would simply disappear. So the man was stealing the stuff from him, you know. It's a kind of weird situation. And the man and his friends began to suspect that this stranger was a fox. Now, north of the village, there was a, amongst a pile of broken stones, there was an old tumble-down grave with very deep holes in it. The thing you've got to be aware of is that foxes live in holes in the ground. I think we all know that, right? And often the holes are old graves. Old graves are the perfect site for a fox to live in. So very often they'll emerge from the grave and come and turn themselves into human beings, and either male or female, in this case male, and come to visit somebody. And the consequences can be quite interesting. Anyway, they reckoned that it was here that the foxy stranger must live. So one day the villagers armed themselves and went there in a body. They lay in wait for a long while, but heard nothing untoward. They stayed there into the early hours of the night, when they heard a faint sound coming from one of the holes, as if thousands of men were whispering amongst themselves. Again, it's, it's perfect for a movie, this. I mean, a good movie. They waited motionless, and suddenly a stream of countless little men, no more than one foot high, came pouring out of the hole. 
the villagers raised a hue and cry and went into the attack. You can kind of see the picture here. Even as they hold their weapons, they burst into flames and in the twinkling of an eye, the little man, the little men had all vanished. All that was left behind was a single tiny top knot, a petit chignon, no larger than a walnut shell, bound in silken gauze and stitched with gold thread. And it gave off the most indescribably foul stench. And this tiny little detail about the top knot, there was all that was left, these, these apparitions, these strange creatures had disappeared and all that was left was this little tiny top knot which stank to high heaven. Um, is an extraordinary touch with which Pu Song Ning finishes that story. Um, I'll read the last of the short stories now, then we'll have a break. This is on page 10, and it's called A Scar on the Eye, uh, a Young Bai Yen. A hunter was lying in wait one night in the mountains when he saw a tiny figure no more than two feet tall walking alone down a gully in his direction. In a little while, another equally small figure appeared. When these two met, they inquired of each other where they were going. I'm on my way to see Yang with the scar on his eye, replied the first. Last time I saw him, he seemed very poorly and weak. I don't think much of his chances. I'm on my way there too, said the second little man. I confess, I concur with your prognosis. So this is a mysterious person called Yang, and apparently he's got a scar on his eye. Now the hunter could tell straight away that these were not normal mortals. That's a very common sentence in Liao Jai. You suddenly know that the person you're dealing with is not a common person. Must either be a ghost, or a Huli Jing, or some other weird person. No normal mortal. He gave a great cry, and the two of them vanished. That night, the hunter caught a fox, and above the beast's left eye, there was a scar the size of a coin. So this fox was, in fact, the yang that they were talking about. And that's the end of that story. It's just kind of a throwaway story. It's very, um, um, very casual. It's almost a shaggy dog story, but not quite. Now, I'm going to stop there because we'll take a short break and then I'll, I'll move on to the, um, the longer and more challenging stories that are coming in the second half of today's presentation. Thanks, we'll just take five minutes break. Um, so I'm trying to um, put before you examples that illustrate the incredible range of these stories. Because, and I started off with some short ones. And um, I would say that probably about one quarter of the stories in the Aljai are those short ones, you know. And I try to include a, a good proportion of those in my, in my first book, and I will in my second book. And um, now I want to move on to what I call the medium-length stories, which I suppose in modern Chinese you would call zhongpian uh, And um, these are the ones that are longer than those short ones, but not as long as the fully-fledged, almost tranchy like stories that I'll come to at the end. Um, and, and, and the example I've chosen is in Chinese, it's simply called Chu uh, Sui Liang, after the famous um, uh, uh, Tang Dynasty um, statesman and calligrapher. And, but it's called that, but it's not really about, just about him. And I've, I've, I've changed the title into, into, into the Clouds or A Cure Without Medicine. I take great liberties with the titles because sometimes Pu Sui Ming's titles are very, um, very brief and they don't really help. Um, and this is a story about, it has a kind of, um, it's, it's more developed than those very short ones, but it's still not as developed as some of the big ones, which I'm going to come to big ones later. Um, 
it's about it's about a young um, well I'll, I'll I'll just start it off. There was a certain Mr. Jarl in Shandong who rented lodgings from a prominent local family. He was all alone in the world, living in straitened circumstances, and suffering from an intestinal obstruction which had brought him almost to death's door. And now, you see, Paul's been being very, very straightforward about things, you know. If he talks about um, physical things, you know, he doesn't, he's, he's not afraid to be terribly, terribly blunt. This man's suffering from acute, um, what we would call constipation, right? His bowels have completely um, seized up. One day during one of his periodic crises, because that can be a terrible condition if it gets too bad, he made a supreme effort to drag himself to a cooler place and went to lie down outside on his veranda. When he woke from his nap, the most beautiful creature he'd ever seen was sitting there right beside him. So suddenly he comes back from, and, he, and suddenly there's this unbelievably beautiful girl sitting right next to him. You know, you may think that's an ordinary situation. I think it's pretty odd. Um, he asked her who she was. So who are you, darling? I've come here to be your wife, announced this female apparition. To which, in great consternation, he replied, but madam, I'm a poor man and gravely ill. How can I possibly have a wife? I mean, it's the most extraordinary. He just launches us straight into this most bizarre situation. Here's a man basically dying of constipation. He can hardly move. And he drags himself off to the veranda and back to it. And there's this beautiful lady saying, I want to be your wife. But the girl says, I can cure you. And the man says, I'm afraid my sickness can't be that easily cured. I'm suffering from a severe obstruction of the bowels. Even if you knew a most efficacious remedy with which to cure this ailment of mine, I, I do not possess the means to procure the costly ingredients necessary. I can cure you without medicine, declared the girl. So now we get to the heart of the story. She placed her hands on his stomach and began to give him a vigorous massage. The palms of her hands seemed to be on fire. She generated huge heat with her hands. She's a healer, right? That's what she is. After a while, the internal obstruction showed signs of dissipating, and Zhao's belly began emitting a rumbling sound. Another moment, and he had to rush out to the toilet, to the privy. He'd only taken a few steps when he was obliged to tear down his trousers and relieve himself on the floor, discharging a huge quantity of sticky excrement. Pushing Lin does not mind some pretty graphic physical details, you know. So he's, he's pooing on the floor, to put it in blunt English. And once his insides were quite evacuated, his whole body felt light and well again. And he returned to the couch. Pray, who are you? My dear lady, he said to the girl, please tell me your name, that in days to come I can put up, I can set up your image and offer you thanks. To which she replied, I am an immortal fox spirit. Now, how would you react if you found yourself sitting next to an immortal fox spirit? I'd like you to think about that and write me an essay of 500 words before the next Saturday. I'm kidding, don't worry. But I mean, you know, this is the kind of thing that Pu Ming takes for granted, okay? This guy's suffering from a terrible medical condition and he thinks he's pretty much about to die and he, he finds himself next to this beautiful girl. She turns out to be a healing, uh, a healing expert and a fox spirit. I am an immortal fox spirit, and in the days of the Tang Dynasty, you were once the great Chancellor Chu Sui Liang. So this is talking about previous, previous lives, previous incarnations, which is something Pu Sun Ming takes for granted, you know. I mean, when you, when you go out for a coffee with a friend to um, Newtown Plaza or something, and you sit down and you say, oh, who are you? Oh, I'm a reincarnation of, you know, um, uh, Dufu, the great poet of the time. I mean, 
that is not a normal conversation, is it? You know, that's not what you say nowadays. You say, oh, I'm a second year student at Hang Seng University, right? But I mean, the point is, for Pu Sun Ling, he takes for granted the whole nature of reincarnation, what he called in the previous story, karmic affinity. It's all about previous lives, about predestination. And these are ideas that to a certain extent stem from Buddhism, but they're also present in Taoism, and they're very much part of the perennial Chinese philosophy. And she's saying, you are the reincarnation of Chu Sui Liang, right? The famous Tang Dynasty person, right? And you were a benefactor of my family. You did good things to my family, you know, a thousand years ago. So I've come to pay you back now by healing your unfortunate, you know, um, constipation. And um, uh, your kindness has been forever engraved upon my heart. I couldn't understand why. I couldn't read the, I the wrong glasses on. Your kindness has been engraved upon my heart. I've long sought you out. Now at last I have found you and I've been able to make you some return. Now Zhao was extremely, was dreadfully ashamed of his foul state because he basically made a mess, you know. He's, he's, he's disgusting, I mean, he's just disgraced himself. And he feared that the filthy surroundings of his humble cottage and the rude stove would pollute the young lady's fine dress. But she simply asked him to usher her indoors from the veranda and accordingly, he showed her into his apartment, furnished, furnished as it was, only with the bare rush mats on the earth, an earthen kang, and an unlit stove. Poverty such as this would be too great a humiliation for you, he said, and even if you were willing to accept it, look around you, my rice vat is empty. I have no means of supporting a wife. But she replied, do not concern yourself on my account. And even as she spoke, Zhang looked around him, Zhao, sorry, Zhao looked around him and saw, and now we have what's called the transformation scene, which you probably have heard of. I mean, in the great ballet, you know, if you go to see the great ballet, one of the great Tchaikovsky ballets, the Nutcracker, or you, 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 you expect to see a transformation scene when suddenly, you know, the Cinderella's whatever, her little hovel becomes a palace, she meets the prince, and everybody lives happily ever after. It's a transformation scene. Because he looks around him, and in the twinkling of an eye, the walls of his apartment are all lined with silver wallpaper, and the entire room shone like a bright as a mirror. Everything was up in the cottage was entirely transformed. She's worked her magic, you see. It's magic. And in fact, we should not hesitate to use the word magic about Pu Sung Ming. He's talking about magic. Magic is the way in which ordinary things are transformed into extraordinary things. And if you can learn to look at the world through the eyes of Pu Sun Ling, the most ordinary thing can become extraordinary. You know, you might walk out of here and go and have a coffee in the coffee shop downstairs, and suddenly you look around you and you're in a palace with, with, a, with a handsome prince, you know, and his, his um, Tesla cars waiting outside to drive you to, um, you know, um, some wonderful place for a holiday. Everything has been transformed by magic. So magic is at the core of Pu Sung Ling. And if you believe in magic, you'll enjoy Pu Sung Ling. You know, if you believe in fairies, you'll enjoy Pu Sung Ling. The famous story of Peter Pan, you know, you've got to, do you believe in fairies? Put your hand up if you believe in fairies. No, don't worry. You don't have to put your hand up. But I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, if you believe in fairies, you'll enjoy Pusun I believe in fairies. I love Pusun Ling. I believe in fox spirits. I believe in ghosts. I believe in the most extraordinary things happening all the time because, because your imagination can create them at the drop of a hat. You can lie. I once lay in a hospital bed. I, I, I was ill. I was taken to the hospital here in Sha Tin, to the Prince of Wales Hospital, during one of my visits to Hang Seng, actually. I had appendicitis, and they had no room for me in the, in the hospital. They put me in the corridor. So I had to be lying in the corridor for about three days. And some of my very kind friends came to visit me from Hang Seng. And I lay in that corridor, 
And in my imagination, I was living in a magical palace, you know, with beautiful ladies walking up and down the corridor. They were the, they were the nurses, you know, and the doctors were like the, the king's officials and so on and so forth. And if you can do that, if you, if you can use the magic of your imagination to make life um, transcend the ordinary, you, you've, you, you've, you've really got something very useful, a very useful tool for coping with ordinary reality. And I think that's what Putin is all, he's, he's never really, he's always talking about human beings and, and their lives, but he's injecting this extraordinary element of magic, of the supernatural into everyday situations. That's why he can start the story by saying, here's a man who really needs to go to the toilet. You know, he's terribly badly um, affected. He can't wait. He, and, and then suddenly this, this beautiful girl gives him a massage and everything is changed, transformed, and she turns out to be, you know, the reincarnation of somebody from the Tang Dynasty who's come to pay him back, and everything, everything is, is magically transformed. Anyway, at that moment, you see, um, uh, I, I'm going to jump ahead because there was a sudden moment when, when she's in the house and she sees, um, she sees this, um, Rabbit, okay. This is a modern picture based on this story. She sees a rabbit. And halfway down the, the, the page 12, the old pounder of the herb of immortality has come for me because the rabbit lives in the moon, as every Chinese person knows that. Well, it's a white hair, really. You know, you know my, my, my three-year-old son, when he grew up in Tianjin, used to learn the song, you know, Xiao Bai Tu, Bai Yo Bai, Liang Er Do Shu Qi Da. I'm sure you all know that song. Anyway, the little white hair. And, um, and, and so the girl says to the white hair, on you go, go ahead. And the, ha the hair hurried out, whereupon she ordered Zhao, and this is the climax now. We've had the transformation scene, we've had the introduction, the transformation scene, the magic, and now we've got the conclusion. Because every story has to end. Every story has to begin and end. And this story is now going to end. And she says to Zhao, fetch me a ladder. It's very dramatic. It's very like a ballet, you know. She's been, she's now going to make her exit, and the music is building up. And he, he goes and gets a ladder from outside, and he puts it against a tall tree, and it reaches up higher than the topmost branch of the tree. She climbs first, and he follows after her. And from the very top, she looks down, and she calls out, Friends and relatives, if you want to come and join us, climb the ladder now. They all gaze at each other in complete amazement. <coughs> Not one of them dared to do as she suggested, except for a young boy, a servant, who jumped blithely onto the ladder and went shinning up, shinning up the ladder. And up, up and up the three of them climbed until the top of the ladder disappeared it disappeared into the clouds, and they could none of them be seen. They disappeared into the clouds. The guests examined the ladder afterwards and found it to be no more than a broken old door frame with its wooden panels knocked out. And when they went back into Zhao's apartment, they found it to be the same old, dirty, unfinished room as before. They resolved to question the serving boy about this strange business when he returned but he never did. So that's, that's the magical ending of this story. <laughs> <coughs> this is a modern um, artist's a rather free um, interpretation of the story. I quite like, the, I quite like that picture, actually. Um, well, in that, in that sort of um, medium-length story, um, you, have, you start to see the artists at work I mean, now, Pu Sung Ning, instead of just giving you a quick, a quick sort of zhu kuai xiao shuo about a louse or about a, a, a strange creature appearing in the middle of the sea, he now starts to develop the story into a, a, a dramatic form with a beginning and a middle and an end and with, with a personality, with a certain situation and with the intervention of magic, basically. And... Um, He's starting to fly. He's starting to learn how to develop this form into something bigger, something more dramatic. And don't forget that at this time in China, 
round about 1650s, 1700. There was the most wonderful Chinese drama being written. For example, the great plays of Tang Xianzu from the late Ming Dynasty, plays like Mu Dan Ting, you know, the Peony Pavilion. The Chinese um, literary and cultural world was seeing an amazing flowering of dramatic art, more or less contemporary with William Shakespeare, and um, a fantastically powerful um, development in, in, in the theatrical world. And, and to a certain extent, Pu Sung Ming is sharing in that, because his stories have a very strong dramatic sense, which is why they which is why filmmakers love them, but filmmakers somehow never rise to the challenge. You know, that story that we just read could be a wonderful little movie, but um, it's never been made into one. Okay, um, I'm going to finish now with the two, with two what I call major stories, two, two longer ones. And, um, <clears throat> and they are really quite long. So I'm not going to try and read them because they're too long. I'm going to try and retell them in my own words. <clears throat> and the first one in Chinese is called Wei Gunzi. It's, it's, I've called it the rake's progress, because it's about a young man from a very wealthy family who, um, from the very beginning, was rather a bad guy. I mean, he was a thoroughly dissolute fellow, a libertine. I don't know, many of you may not know the word libertine. It's somebody who, who simply enjoys life who enjoys the world of the senses, who likes to make love, who likes to drink wine, who likes to behave badly. And anyway, this young man of the Wei family had enjoyed intimate relations with every one of the attractive maidservants and serving women employed in his family establishment. So, you see, in, in, in his family, um, there would have been many young maids and so on, and he'd already slept with all of them. You know, he was a bad boy. He grew up to be a libertine, right? And, um, and that sets the scene for the whole story. It's a long story and a very shocking story, I'm warning you now. And uh, anyway, this young man sets off with a lot of money. He, 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 he has daddy's credit card. You know, he goes off on a, on a personal grand tour of China, wanting to visit every pleasure quarter and sample all the most celebrated sing-song girls of the land, so he's decided to go and call on, you know, um, Miss So and So in in Xi'an and Miss Miss So and So in you know Lo, uh, Luoyang, and so he's off on a bit of a tour, and um, he's going to have some fun. And whenever he came across a woman who was even moderately attractive, he'd spend a night or two with her, and if she pleased him greatly, he might stay on for as long as three months. So this is the young man a thoroughly dissolute uh, libertine. <clears throat> Meanwhile, an uncle of his, a prominent official who had reached retirement, had returned to live in the family home, and he was very, very indignant. He was cross, very angry about his nephew's behavior. And he tried to, tried to give him some discipline. He got a teacher to come and, and teach him. And, um, um, but the young man was simply, he was, he was incorrigible and he, he was just behaving very, very badly. Now, um, the young man was a very clever man, and he was able to do quite well in the exams. And then he finally persuaded his uncle that the time was come to let him, to let him go, to let him enjoy life again. So um, um, eventually, he went up to the capital for his exams, but the uncle sent a servant with him to keep a record of his activities. And several years went by like this. And, um, and, and during these years, he still wasn't really able to be free. Um, but finally, he, he passed his final exam. He got his doctorate. And he, he changed his name, and he started to go up on his, on his travels again. And one day, he passed through the ancient provincial capital of Xi'an. And he, 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 he met a young actor. A female impersonator, a, a dan, you know, um, a young actor who played girls' parts, right, called Lo Hui Ching, a pretty lad of some 16 or 17 years. Now, I'm at the bottom of page 13. I, I've given up trying to retell it because it's too complicated. So he met this young actor, <clears throat> a very pretty boy of age 16 or 17, as beguiling as any girl. 
and he took a strong fancy to him, he falls in love with this boy. They spent the nights together. And with time, he grew greatly attached to Law and showered him with gifts. So this is his first great love affair. And it's with a boy who plays girls' parts on the stage. He heard that Law had recently married an attractive young wife and intimated to him he would like to meet her as well. And Law had no objection. And the next night, he brought her along. And the three of them shared the same bed. So they're having what I think they call a, a threesome, is what it's called. And then this menage continued for some time. And a genuine bond of affection grew up between the two of them. Wei even suggested taking them both home with him to Xianyang and inquired what other family dependents they had. My mother passed away some years ago, top of page 14. My mother passed away some years ago, replied the young actor, Law. But my father's still alive. In fact, Law is not my real name. My mother used to work, now listen carefully here, my mother used to work for the Wei family of Xianyang. But she was later sold to the Law family, and four months later she gave birth to me. If I were to go with you to Xianyang, I could even make inquiries about my father. Wei asked in some consternation what his mother's family name had been. And when the boy replied that it was Lu, Wei was visibly shaken and he broke out in a cold sweat. This Miss Lu had been one of his own family's maidservants. So he had for the past while been sharing a bed with his own son. In other words, this boy actor was actually the, the child of one of the maids that he had um, slept with. So he'd been sleeping with his own son. It gets worse. The story gets worse. So that's not the first stage. Anyway, he gave this young man a present and told him to go away and find a new profession. And then he invented a pretext to, to recommence his grand tour, promising to return one day and make contact with the two of them. Anyway, subsequently, he was made prefect of the city of Suzhou. So, He's actually been able to get a job because he's got family connections and he's passed his exam. <coughs> <coughs> so he became the prefect of the city of Suzhou, and there he met a beautiful young sing-song girl by the name of Shen Wenyang. Now I call these ladies sing-song girls, and um, you may think sing-song girl originally means a girl who sings. It doesn't. Sing-song girl was a term that was invented in Shanghai. Um, because in Shanghai, in, in, in the um, pleasure houses, the flower houses, they, called, they would refer to the young ladies of pleasure. They'd call them xian sheng, you know. And, and the foreigners thought they were saying sing song, you know. They heard them saying sing song in Shanghai Hua. And, and the foreigners thought they were saying sing song. So they called these girls sing song girls, even though they were, strictly speaking, what we would call courtesans. They were not common or garden prostitutes. They were high-class courtesans. Anyway, he met a beautiful sing-song girl by the name of Shen Weinyang. He was utterly captivated by her charms. And in the course of a night spent making love to her, he asked her in a playful tone, tell me, does your name Weinyang come from that famous line by the poet, oh, sweet Miss Wei, song of a gentle spring breeze. So he's, he's, he's having sort of love talk with her. And she says, no, it's got nothing to do with that. My mother was, when my mother was 17 years old, she was a famous sing-song girl. And a certain young gentleman from Xianyang, with the same name as yourself, a Mr. Wei, stayed with her for three months. He even promised to marry her. Then one day he just went away. And eight months later, she gave birth to me. And she called me Miss Wei after my real father's family name. In other words, he was sleeping with his own daughter. So first of all, he's been sleeping with his own son. Now he's been sleeping with his own daughter. And um, basically, he, he, um, he, he decides to poison her in order to, in order to conceal his guilt. I'm not going to finish the story, because that's it, basically. That's it. He, he, um, he dies a miserable death in the end to, to pay for his sins. This is a young man who, who um, was completely promiscuous in his life 
and ends up um, paying the price for it. And it's a very, it's a very powerful story. Um, and he, and at the very end of the story, he dies. So there you have, there you have one of Pu Sung Ming's more developed, more, I mean, very, very densely developed, very richly developed story about a young man's um, path through life. Now, I'm going to end with, with, with what is probably one of the best stories in the whole of Yao Chai, called The Second Minute Dream. Uh, 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 the Second Minute Dream, Xu uh, Huang Yang. And that is on page, um, page, six, page 16. <coughs> Um, Pu Song Ling was writing within the tradition. I mean, he, he inherited a whole um, 2,000 years, really, of Chinese um, fictional writing. And um, in this case, he's harking back to a famous Tang Chuanqi called Zhen Zhongji, the story within the pillow. And I'm sure you've all heard of that story, where a young man is traveling and he stops at an inn and um, he... Um, in the inn, there's a Taoist priest, and there's a man cooking, uh, cooking um, millet, Huang Niang. And, and this young traveler falls asleep with his head on a pillow. Of course, the pillow is a Chinese pillow made of porcelain, hollow pillow. And while he sleeps, he dreams of a whole lifetime of where he rises to fame and wealth and success. And then finally, he comes to grief. And it's a short story. It's not very long. And what, what Pu Sung Ling does, he calls his the continuation of the, of the yellow millet dream. So he, he takes that idea of life being a dream and he expands it enormously. So basically, um, Xu Huangyang is one of the great masterpieces in, 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 in Liao Chai. It's one of the greatest of all the stories. It's not about romance. It's not about a person falling in love. It's not about a weird thing. It's not about um, <clears throat> a, a reincarnation. It's about um, the eternal theme of life being a dream. And, 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 it, and it has the form and the shape of a classical drama. And indeed, um, the great dramatist Tang Xianzu also wrote a dramatic treatment of this very same theme in his, fa in his famous um, uh, play entitled Han Dan Meng, the, the, the dream of Han, Han Dan, because Han Dan was the place where the young man in the original story fell asleep and dreamt of the whole course of his life. <clears throat> of course, to a modern person, this is very interesting because they always say that if you're drowning, if you're dying, if you're drowning at sea and you go down and down and up and you know, you keep, and I've had this experience myself, I very nearly drowned in the Black Sea once, and as you go down, you, you see your whole life flashing before your eyes. You kind of see your whole life like a movie, you know. You're being born, and you grow up, and, you, and, then, and um, in a sense, this, this um, recurring theme in Chinese literature is a little bit like that. It's saying that you, 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 your life itself is a dream, and you can see it as a dream, and you, if only you can see that in its true light, you can become enlightened. That's what the that's the key thing. Is that there is, out of this vision of life as a dream, there is an exit. There is an exit. The exit is enlightenment. The exit is understanding. And if you can achieve that, then you can live properly. It's a very very profound um, thought, I think personally, and, and and funnily enough, it's also a thought that recurs in in <coughs> in the work of Shakespeare. Um, I'm going to um, try and, and touch on various moments in this, this wonderful story. Um, it starts off with a bunch of students. They've, they've, been in, they've been in Peking, they've finished their exams, they think they're wonderful. You know, the whole, it starts off with some very, very self-satisfied students um, going on a bit of, a, bit of an outing. <coughs> Sorry.
and they, they come to this temple and they've heard about this temple and there's, there's apparently a fortune teller there and um, um, they bow to the fortune teller, page 16, about line 7 and, and sat down and he could tell at once that these young men were very pleased with themselves and he adopted a deliberately obsequious tone of voice when speaking to them. Now Zeng, the main character in the story, he found himself idly and inquired with a smug smile, tell me, does high office lie within my allotted fortune? Am I going to become, you know, the Minister of Justice or the, the Chief Executive of, you know, Sun Hong Kai Corporation or something? Am I going to become, am I destined to wear the dragon robe and the jade girdle? And then the fortune teller, who's actually taking the mickey out of him, says, a full 20 years of undisturbed tranquility will be yours. For 20 years, you will be a prime minister. Wow, this was music to Zhang's ears. He looked, he looked happier than ever. Anyway, basically, he lies down to sleep. It's raining outside the temple. And they go inside, and he lies down to sleep. And I think the modern illustrations often show him sleeping. There he is. He's lying down to sleep. You see, this is a modern um, cartoon version. And this is, I think, the next one. This is also one. And, he, and when he falls asleep, basically, he dreams of his whole life passing before his eyes. And he becomes very wealthy. He becomes very powerful. He becomes very corrupt. And he becomes, you know, like, um, who, who can I mention? I'd better not mention anybody, but a high official in, uh, in, 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 in China who has become very, very corrupt and is being put in jail. And he gets, he gets summoned before the court of the underworld, before Yama, and he gets punished. But this is where the story becomes so much better than the original story, Chen Zhongji, because the detail with which it describes his punishment, the suffering he goes through, the incredible um, pain he suffers. Uh, he's taken to the, finally, to the, um, the hill, the mountain with all the sharp blades on. This is the ultimate. It's from all the, all the pictures of Buddhist hell, you know. He goes through hell, basically, in his dream. He, he experiences the ups and downs, and finally he is condemned to the most terrible um, torture. It's described in very, very great detail. It's actually very, it's very hard to read because he suffers so much. He has boiling oil pour, poured all over him. He has to climb up a hill and then eventually he, he's put on, on these sharp blades. It's, it's, it's very, very detailed and very long. And, um, and at the very end, he wakes up. Bottom of page 21, because I'm going to have to, to draw this to a, to a close. Um, so having gone through all this, um, this nightmare, basically, he suddenly wakes up and he yells out, you know, um, and he hears somebody saying, wake up, you're having a nightmare. And suddenly, bottom of page 21, suddenly it's on, comes to his senses. And the old monk is still sitting there, cross-legged, silent on his meditation mat. Evening is drawing on, his friends say. We're hungry. You've been asleep for a long while. Let's go and get some takeaway food. You know, you've been sleeping there and, and you've had a nightmare. And Zhang rose from his bed with a dazed expression on his face. The monk smiled at him enigmatically and said, so tell us then, did you become a prime minister? Zhang was startled by this. He begged the monk to enlighten him as to his meaning. And the monk said, cultivate virtue and compassion. The blue lotus of enlightenment grows even out of the foulest mire of the fiery pit. But what would a poor hermit like myself know of such things? Anyway, Zhang, who had been so full of himself when he arrived at the temple, he left the place in a chastened frame of mind. That means he was really shocked out of his ignorance into thinking seriously about life. His arrogance and his worldly ambitions greatly tempered by his strange dream. 
He walked off into the mountains and nothing is known of what became of him thereafter. Um, and that's the end of that particular story. I think what I've, what I've wanted to do today, and I don't know if I've succeeded, but what I've wanted to do is to show you, in, in a nutshell, something of the range of what these stories contain. I, I put before you, you know, 20 stories, short, very short ones, medium, and then two very long ones, and um, two very long, ambitious ones. And it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a puzzle in a way, because Pu Sung Ling could have written a very long novel. He could have written a novel like Hong Lam Meng, you know. He had the ability. Or he could have written um, four or five long stories like Xu Huang Liang. But he, but he didn't do that. Instead, he produced a kind of um, hodgepodge, a collection of tiny, tiny bits and pieces, miniatures, some slightly longer ones, and then some really full scale. Um, maybe, maybe in the whole of Liao Zhai, there are about 40 or 50 big stories, I mean, the big ones. And you could just put those in a book. But I think it's really nice to mix them all up and to have them. Um, like in some musical compositions, you have a minuet, you have a minuet, you have a, a, a gavotte, you have a, a, a mazurka, and then you maybe you have something more serious, like an adagio, and you mix it all up and you, you, you create a kind of suite in which you get all the different elements mixed together. And, and, and I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the, 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 the overall effect, if you read the whole of the book, if you read all the 500 stories in, in, in Liao Chai Zhi Yi, you have this incredible gallery of varied um, perceptions, varied pictures, varied narratives, varied shapes of um, varied visions of human existence, varied interpretations of what it means to be alive, from the, from the very romantic, emotional stories that talk about, that talk about love, basically. And there are many of those. There are maybe 40 of those in the book. Uh, and then the very tiny ones that talk about little strange twitchings, you know, little things falling off tables, you know, um, odd sounds coming from a motor car, you know. I mean, little tiny things and big things. And then in between sort of halfway, half medium sized things. And, and when you read the whole book, you have this incredibly rich and varied kaleidoscope, really. It's a kaleidoscope where you see infinite numbers of different colors and, and perceptions. And you end up with a very rich, um, a rich feast of mind. I mean, it's a feast of the eye. There's a visual feast. There's also a, a mental feast because it's all these different takes on human nature, all these different takes on human emotion, all these different takes on human experience, per se. And that's, I think, what it boils down to in the end. It's an extraordinary encyclopedia, an encyclopedic gallery of human experience, very, very um, poignant, um, poignantly recorded a gallery of human experience. Um, well, that's where, where I'm going to end. Next week, I'm going to talk about um, the commentators. Not next week, the following week, because we have a break, because it's Easter. But when my third talk, which will be um, uh, halfway through April, uh, 15th, I think, um, yeah, it's a fortnight from today, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the five great commentators on, on Liao Jai and um, how they can help us to understand these stories, how they can help us to see them in their true light. Because I think, I think it's the key. This, to me, is the key to what I call the dufa, the way of reading Liao, the Liao Chai Zhi Yi dufa. And I think these great commentators from the 19th century, when Chinese culture was still a whole, they understood how to read the stories. And I'm going to give you some examples um, of how they did that and how we can use them to open the door to a real perception of these stories. Well, I'll stop there, and uh, we have a little bit of time. If anybody wants, um, we have a few minutes. If anybody wants to ask me a question, I'll try and um, answer them, but I can't guarantee I'll be able to. But mainly, um, 
I would encourage you to read the stories because they, they are the thing, you know, the stories are the thing. <clears throat> oh, those lights are so bright. Mm. Hi, Professor Meekler. Thank Hi. you very much for Hi. the fascinating uh, lecture. And uh, you have uh, shown us many illustrations. Now, can I interrupt you briefly? I'm very, very oh, hard of hearing. Okay. So could you, you speak? Louder. Well, no, oh, yeah, okay. louder but slower, please. Oh, okay. Because I'm, okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I don't want to have to ask you to repeat the whole thing again. So you, go ahead. Just, okay. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much hmm. for the fa fascinating lecture. Thank you. And you have shown us many illustrations through the PowerPoint oh, yeah. uh, about those uh, uh, strange tales. Uh, so I'm wondering how these il illustrations, um, because you have mentioned they are helpful. So I'm wondering uh, what do you mean by helpful? Are they helpful to readers or were they helpful to your translation? And uh, another question is, uh, uh, I was impressed by what you have mentioned last time uh, about you uh, are the servant of uh, the author in your translation. So I'm wondering, uh, what's the role of readers in your mind as a translator? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very good questions. Um, I'll take the illustrations first. I mean, I found, as a translator, I sometimes found the illustrations very helpful because the person who did them, they're not great illustrations. They're from Shanghai in about 1880. And they belong to the period of the Jian Shi Jai, that kind of thing. Um, and they're not, they're not um, contemporary with Pu Sun Ming, but I sometimes found them very helpful because they, they helped me to visualize the situation, to see exactly where the furniture was or what the person was wearing. Sometimes it was helpful for me. I think they're also helpful for Western readers who are not used to Chinese furniture. If I keep coming back to furniture, but I mean, not used to furniture, clothes, buildings, trees, and so on, how the, how the vases were set out. So I find, that, I find them helpful. And I, I've had a lot of good feedback from my first book to the illustrations. They help you to, um, to concentrate and visualize. Oh gosh, now I forgot what your second question was earlier. Uh, the role of a reader. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I'm, you mentioned that I call myself the servant. I, I am a servant of the, of the author, but I'm also, of course, the servant of the reader. I'm very, very conscious. Of that. I'm always being accused of being much too um, reader conscious, you know. I, I've been accused of being a consumerist because I want to please my reader. Well, I mean, frankly, um, I'm not ashamed of that. I, want, I would like my readers to be pleased, you know. I, I think that's my job. I think that was Pu Sun Ling's job. He wanted his friends to be pleased by his stories. He did it for fun, you know. He wanted to give them a, a, an entertaining and enlightening experience, just like Cao Xue Qin with Hong Lai Meng, you know. It was both entertaining and enlightening. I think the same is true of Pu Sun Ling, but, but he was the great creative genius. I am the servant in the sense that I wish to um, transmit what he did in such a way that it can also create pleasure for the readers. Because without the readers, it's completely pointless. You know, you might as well put it in the waste paper basket, you know, and be done with it, or light the fire with it, you know. But if I want, if whenever I get some feedback which says I really enjoyed those stories, I, I feel I've fulfilled my function. I've been, I've fulfilled my role as the servant of author and reader, and bringing them together. And uh, there was a wonderful. Um, very long review of my first book in the Washington Post uh, at the Chinese New Year in 2016, I think, and um, which basically said, give this book to your friends for Chinese New Year because it's so much fun. Now, that is the ultimate, um, for me, the ultimate compliment, if it's enjoyable, frankly. I don't really mind what the, what the serious translation critics say. I've frankly lost interest in translation theory and translation studies. I care about my reader, and I care about my author, you know? And, and the service, and it is a service, it's a vocation. The service is to both. It's to both. Mm. Thank you. Uh, 
Oh, it's good, but now I'm going to have a hard one. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. As I said, very inspiring, always, as usual. I read the, some of the old, old time story years ago, but uh, it never occurred to me to be that interesting until today. So, thank you very much. But I got two, two uh, uh, not really questions, but uh, maybe two points I would like to make. The first one. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the closure of the story and how you translate it, right? I think it, it, it's very, uh, when I read the translation, I thought, wow, you know, this, this is how Hu uh, uh, closed, uh, uh, closed his stories. Like, uh, for instance, it, it's all, almost like a certain stop sometimes. And this is how you render it. And uh, uh, perhaps on, let me just quote an example here. Uh, let me see, on page 12, uh, which is the end of uh, Into the Crowd, or the Cure of the Out, and closing sentence uh, is, but he never did. Yeah. But he never did. It's just like that. I mean, it's so clean and tidy. And yeah. it, it's just like the original. And then with the uh, Rick. Progress, which is on page 22, uh, you got, uh, and nothing is known of what became of him thereafter. So, and then, all of a sudden, you know, just stop, just like that, mm -hmm. you know, and I really enjoyed that. And then, I think that, that there's one more example where I could, uh, oh yeah, that was the first story on page two, uh, a strange, Laos, and the last sentence was, the man eventually died. <laughs> Four words, my goodness, it was so, it was so interesting, but so forceful, so forceful, and uh, thank you, thank you very much. And the other, uh, and the other uh, point I would like to make is, is that, uh, uh, perhaps one or two points, is the, is the blurring of the boundaries of the lines between the human world and the supernatural world. And uh, supernatural world seems to me in Leojai uh, is actually used to illustrate, to criticize the, and to expose the kind of wrongdoings or you know, abnorm abnormalities of the human world uh, many times and many and uh, many of the supernatural creatures, as you described in the story, they have beautiful women, beautiful uh, human beings, as well as uh, the humans, actually, are not as beautiful. And they're actually quite bad, some of them. Some of them. And uh, so, so what do you think of this Chinese view of this uh, blurring of the, of the boundaries in relation to you know, the Western concept of the uh, human world and the supernatural world. And I, I, I know that you have a lot to say about that because I know you're so knowledgeable about almost every culture. So, uh, and, the, and, and then, uh, uh, and it seems to me that uh, you sort of made, made me think of the stories, many stories as satires satires of human folly. And, uh, but, you know, satires not in a kind of a, a kind of a acrimonious way, uh, it's playful, almost good humorously, uh, good humor kind of a satire, showing that uh, Hu Xiongling actually was probably quite tolerant, tolerant, but of course critical and uh, very, so the stories are actually quite didactic. I, I would think that almost is like a, a, a kind of a, a moralist uh, uh, in writing the stories. And I, I would like to hear your views on that particular point. That's all. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. That's an awful lot of things, Gilbert. Um, <coughs> um, let me just 
try and take a couple of them. I mean, the blurring between the natural and the supernatural is a recurring theme. In fact, um, you know, your, your teacher's teacher, Fjaroslav Prushek, he was very strong on this. He wrote that that was the essence of Pus and Ling's art, was that he, he believed he could um, tell stories in which um, the reader could come to believe the possibility of having parallel universes. Basically, they were equally valid, you know, the world of the imagination, the world of magic, the world of the supernatural, the, the sudden apparitions of beautiful ladies is, is, is not a contradiction of everyday life where you have a terrible stomach upset, you know, and the way he's, he just puts the two things together, you eventually start to share his ability to put the two worlds, to have them so, so closely connected that they are blurred. You don't know from one moment to the next which one you're in, and that's quite deliberate. And that's a, that's a kind of a, after you've read a few of the stories, you start to find yourself believing the same thing yourself, you know, which is kind of dangerous if you're driving a car, you know, because you've got to be, you've got to be on one, one world. You don't want to be living on a kind of supernatural plane when you get to the traffic lights, you know. But I mean, when you're at home and you're reading the book, you, you can enter into this um, multi, multi-layered universe, which I think is very much part of his art. Uh, uh, the, the other thing that you mentioned was about his, his tolerance and his, the way, he's, the way he, he exposes the frailty of human nature. And, 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 and with, with that story about the libertine, I mean, he's, he's looking at him, but he's looking at him with compassion, you know. It's, it's more than just tolerance. He actually feels compassion for this man. He doesn't, he doesn't come straight out and say, you're a bad man you've sinned, go to hell, you know. He actually says, this is a human frailty. It, it arises out of this and this and this, and I feel compassion for it. I think in that sense, he's, he's a very compassionate writer. And his, the way, when he satirizes human society and human behavior, he's not doing it out of a kind of um, a sense of wanting to reform society according to Marxist ideas. I mean, he's always being held up like that. By, by, by the official critics in, 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 in post-1949 China because they want him to be a kind of revolutionary writer. He simply wasn't, you know. He wasn't writing for the people for a start. He was writing for a very small elite who could read his very difficult Chinese. But he was sharing with them his, his um, understanding of how, how frail human nature is, how people do behave badly, how people can be unkind how they can do this and the other, but he does it in a, very, in a very gentle and compassionate way. And that's something which I think is important. Just as, they, as in the mainland critique, they never really give full value to his pure fantasy, you know, because fantasy does not fit into the Yenan talks on literature. Fantasy actually is not, does not serve the people, but Pu Songlin believed in the value of pure fantasy, just as he believed in the value of the supernatural, and when he talks about human society and um, the, the, you know, the corrupt goings-on, he's not trying to make a political point. He's trying to make a human observation, and then from that you can come to a better understanding of human nature. I think that's what he's trying to do. It's all about human nature. But what, one last thing, Gilbert, you mentioned the way he ends his stories, you know, and we don't know what happened to him. It's a, it's a brilliant technique. I mean, his technique, as a, you know, you talk about a pianist having wonderful technique. I mean, Pu Lin was a virtuoso when it comes to the technique of writing a story. He knows how to begin, how to develop, and how to end. And the closure is often just brilliant, you know. Just the timing, the timing is so right, you know. He knows how to time the ending and how to just bring it to a close you know and very often it's it's it it is perfect it's perfect timing yeah mm. yeah it's hard work it's it's very hard work getting the timing right you know it's, you have to go on fine tuning it the whole time and he did as well. He kept on fiddling with his stories to the bitter end, yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk. Uh, I think it's very insightful sharing uh, puzzling, you know, stories. I hear 
Hi. Over there, sorry, Hi. I didn't know where you were. Hi, yeah, sorry. I, I actually have one question to ask. Yeah. Last time you said that um, the beautiful women, the sing-song girls, the fox, those mysterious creatures, they are a line of some symbol, I guess. It's not as simple as just a box. So, um, and then today we see the common phrases like, oh, there is a fox, and that fox does something, and then uh, it, or she, usually she, uh, disappears uh, out of nowhere after some mission has accomplished, be it like what Professor Fong has said, uh, didactic or compassionate, like you said, uh, there are different maybe functions. And, but I'm, I'm just curious why fox? <laughs> I mean, it could be other animals or I don't know. Just is it, I, I, it's just my, uh, I, I don't have that knowledge, I'm sorry, but uh, is fox kind of sly? and uh, ambiguous in terms of, you know, how it is, uh, how, how, how us, or Chinese people, uh, perceived them as they are deceptively uh, beautiful and tempting. And when you talked about those uh, frailty of human follies, and it seems that uh, if one, usually men, when they want to go wayward, uh, they, they go to the foxes or fox-like women or women, like you said. So, uh, yeah, what do you think fox actually symbolizes in uh, all these stories? Thank you very much. I, I think I'm going to have to refuse to answer that question. It's so difficult. I've written about it. I mean, lots of people have written about it. I mean, I think you should have your own understanding of what a fox is. I mean. It represents a quality. I don't think it's a symbol. It's just not a symbol. It, it, is a, it is a quality in human nature that is not necessarily a woman. I mean, there are fox spirits in, in, in the Aljai who are men. There's a very famous story in which the, the, the fox is a man, and he's, he, he loves his partner so much that he will sacrifice himself. It's a very fine, it comes in my first connection. It's to do with, um, of course, foxes, um, are very wily. They're very cunning. They're very, um, they're very beautiful animals. I mean, I've I've sometimes been watching foxes run across the field, and and they live in the ground. And they live, they live, and therefore, by extension, they are thought of as living in graves. So they share certain qualities with them, um, in that sense, with ghosts. They therefore represent the supernatural. However, they also represent the earthly, they represent the physical, they represent the sensual. You know, they have these lovely long bushy tails and they're very, very, you know, um, soft and loving and lovable. Um, so, um, but they're also very dangerous, you know. You can think about a fox as being a creature of great potential that can do you potential harm. And there's a great element of fear in, 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 in the concept of the fox, that, that the fox will Will cause, um, will will cause um, uh, uh, the gradual loss of, of life. Basically, it's it's which represents a very long tradition of the fear of the fear of love and the fear of um, of surrendering to love and the fear of women. That 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 goes back a very long way, as you know. I mean, in China, it was uh, it was around about the 10th century that. Um, they introduced the habit, the, the custom of binding women's feet, you know, and and at the same time as they did that, I mean, they sometimes attribute that to the great poet Li Ho Zhu, you know, who wrote the most beautiful love poetry. So in a sense, he represents the kind of um, ambivalence. On the one hand, passionate love poems, you know, and on the other hand, um, if it's true that he that he originated this practice, I think it's very unlikely. But I mean. The point is not that that doesn't really matter. The point is at that time that this had this custom, this barbaric custom came in of mutilating the feet of women and of then elevating those mutilated feet to a to a to a position of enormous um, sexual magic, you know, so that men would literally swoon at the very thought of bound feet. I mean, you know, I knew a Chinese gentleman 
who a very fine scholar, who was still, you know, he, he's no longer alive, but I mean, he was alive in the 1980s, who would, even the memory of barn feet would get him really excited, you know. I mean, this is a most peculiar situation, and we can't avoid talking about it in relation to this whole um, complex of ideas surrounding fox spirits and fox, foxy ladies, to, to borrow Jimi Hendrix's expression. I mean, this is, it's, I mean, this is not an easy question to answer. That's why I first of all said I wouldn't answer, but now I've tried to answer, which is very foolish of me. Yeah. But it, it's about um, the kind of um, a very complex attitude towards not just women, but towards love itself, and and that permeates the whole book. The whole the whole of the Arjai could be seen as a kind of a, 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 a PhD thesis, you know, about that, about the nature of of that emotion. And, and, and um, the incredible variety of it, and sometimes the fatal effects of it. And every, every story is in, in some way, well, certainly the longer stories are often about that. And when I, next time I'll talk about certain stories that are, that are closely connected to this idea, and you'll see how very, um, in a sense, how very um, philosophical it is. But at the same time, because this is a story, this, this is a book of, the strange things, you know, to require. Then it never once mentions barn feet. They are not considered to be strange because they were normal. To, to, a, to, a, to an upper class Chinese intellectual like Bu Song Ling or even Sao Sui Chin, you know, this would have been a normal thing, not a, not a, not a strange thing at all. So you, there is not a single story which revolves around the phenomenon of barn feet, you know. And that's also an important fact to bear in mind. Um, but I don't think we should get too theoretical about it. The main thing is to read the stories, you know. Read the stories and enjoy them, and let, allow them to enrich your life, because that's what they'll do. Um, and don't get too theoretical about it. I mean, you know, don't, 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 don't become too abstract about it. Just read the stories. That's probably my last word, <laughs> sorry. Mm. That might be as much as we've got time for, I think. Um, what do you reckon, William? It's almost quarter past four. Any, maybe one more. Any, is there one more question? Or looks like there might be one over there. Hello, Professor. Thank you very much for your talk. I noticed you pay a lot of uh, attention to the geographical information in each of the translation. And I want to know what else information did you search before you start your translation? Could you please share some of the experience before how to start your translation of Chinese classes. Thank you. Um, if I understood you correctly, you want to know um, what kind of things I, I was reading before I did my translation? Well, that's a, that, that would require a very long answer, actually, because I've been, <laughs> I've been working on this for 30 years, and I've read a lot of books in that time. But very briefly, um, no, I can't be very brief. I mean, <laughs> I think, to try and answer your question, a lot of my reading was to do with um, trying to find ways in English to um, communicate what I felt was the spirit of these stories. That meant reading a lot of, a lot of um, uh, fiction about the supernatural. And there's a very long tradition in the English language about that. You know? I don't just mean ghost stories. I mean all kinds of interesting um, writers. I mean, let's even Edgar Allan Poe, for example. You know. You've got to read Edgar Allan Poe or M. R. James. So I read a lot of that. On the Chinese front, um, basically, you've got to read everything because Pu Sun Ling read everything. He was a he was a failed examination student who had to read all had to read all the classics. So if you look at the commentators, they will point out all, almost every page that Pu Sun Ling was referring, uh, alluding to. The Chun Chu Zhuo Zhuan, for example, or you know um, the Li Ji. I mean all the classics, but also the famous poets, the famous prose writers, and um, so I mean, what can I say? I've just tried to keep on reading as much as I can in Chinese literature. Sometimes um, one has to um, actually find, get hold of um, <coughs> information rather than literary sources, actual hard information. And I've got a, I built up a kind of library of my own in which I have resources that I can refer to. 
about things like Chinese medicine, for example, because a lot of the stories, I mean, even some of the stories we read today have reference to our areas of Chinese medicine and, and um, herbal medicine, massage, all these kind of things. So you, I just have to keep on trying to expand my, my sphere of reference in Chinese. And I, could, I, never, I will never have done enough because it's such a huge tradition. I mean, Fusun Ling is coming at a, at a time, you know, the late 17th, early 18th century when Chinese culture had reached a huge um, golden age. I mean, we're, we're, leave, we're, 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 we're in the Kangxi reign, we're moving to the Qianlong reign, and this is what the last great flowering of Chinese culture when they put together the Suku Quan Shu, for example, the great encyclopedia of everything, you know. And um, when um, Cha Shui Chen's grandfather, Cha Yin, completed the completed the the, the, the Quan Tang Shu, all the poetry of the Tang Dynasty. So I mean, basically, in order to do justice to Fu Sun Ling, you'd have to read everything, which of course I can't do, you know. I just do my best to read as much as I can without exhausting myself so much that I couldn't do nothing more. Um, but in the end, in the end, that's not what really matters. In the end, it's not even, neither the English nor the Chinese reading is what really matters. What matters is being able to read the stories with a, de with a degree of intensity, with a degree of concentration that brings them to life in your own mind. That is the hard part. That's like a kind of Zen, Zen process, you know. You actually try to reach the point where you feel, yes, that's how the story works. This moment when she does that or he does that or when so-and-so falls off the chair, that's the point, that's the climax or that's the ending or whatever. And when you, when you feel that, you kind of know it. You know when that happens. And that's, a, that's an internal process. That's a kind of ne um, gong, if you like. That come. The other stuff is why going all the sort of um, information and the reading and all the rest of it. That that's essential. You have to do that. But in the end, I mean, I've been working on this latest collection for about ten years now, and each story takes up an enormous amount of time because I'm only satisfied with it. And even then, I'm not really. Satisfied. I'm only willing to put it into a book and send it to a publisher if I feel the story works if I feel the story actually um, happens, that it actually registers in my mind and therefore hopefully in the mind of the reader. And that's a process that you can't really, um, you can't really rationalize. It's the same with playing a piece of music. You know when you've understood the feeling of the composer, whether it's Beethoven or Chopin, whoever. You, you, you can go on practicing the technique. I, I began training as a pianist, you see. You start, you can learn the technique, you can learn the, the theory of counterpoint and harmony. Yes, all that's fine, but in the end, you can only, the great pianists, the great pianists, they are the ones who are able to actually say, I know what he's trying to say, I know what he feels, and I can, I can live that, I can, I can perform that feeling in my performance of Chopin, whatever it is. And with translation, you see, for me it's exactly the same. You go on and on, um, fiddling around with it, trying to revise it, maybe. I mean, I would guess each story I would have revised 25 times, you know, in different places, and you see them in different ways, and you might pick one up in a, in a cafe, in a, in, a, in a railway station somewhere, and suddenly, oh yeah, that's what, it, that's what it's about. It's not about that, it's about that. And then you think, oh yes, that's how I've got to do it. And that's a living process, that's a living process not a reading process, it's a living process. But I'm kind of straying off the point, but I'm trying to answer your question, but not very successfully. Thank you. I think uh, it's time to wrap up the, uh, the whole lecture. Thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Uh, please help us have your comments on the lecture by standing the uh, QR code here. Thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you all uh, in the third lecture uh, on the 15th of April. Thank you.